The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right. So good evening, everyone. Welcome to Bursa Malaysia webinar series, and thank you so much for coming. My name is Shane. I am the moderator for this webinar. So um, to ensure that you can hear us, I just want to do a quick audio check. So on your screen, there is a uh, webinar control panel. Would you be able to find it? And there's a button to indicate that you raise hand. So if you can hear me clearly, can you please click raise the hand button? All right, awesome. Thank you, you may put down your hands now. Yeah, so we are doing this uh, live now. So you, you can you can see some you can see PC is on the screen now, and uh, I didn't turn on my webcam. Maybe I should turn it on for a bit. Let me see if you can see me. Hi, yeah, that's me. So, but in order to save the bandwidth for today, we are going to you know uh, turn off our webcam so that we can have a smoother internet connectivity. All right, so I'll just turn it off. So, well, uh, today we have a quite amazing turn of webinar attendees and we feel really encouraged. And our topic today is on how to invest in turnaround stock. Okay, and uh, as you may know, turnaround stock are stocks that uh, could have um, losing quarters and then the business are not doing so well and then because the management are not capable of uh, driving the business and suddenly the stock was turned around by a change of business model, or there was a change in management. And today we're going to dissect how we can invest in this kind of turnaround stock that could have hit the rock bottom and turn it up. Of course, the risk is higher for this kind of category of stock, but uh, but of course it comes with a greater reward because if you buy at a manage to buy at a lower price, then when the stock rebound and you can make substantial return. So this is a bit of higher risk, high return kind of category. So uh. The webinar series is about 16 minutes long and con a 19 minute long and consists of two segments. The first segment is 16 minute content and subsequently we have a 30 minute Q&A. So this disclaimer first, okay. All the information shared here on this webinar is educational purpose only. So in no way that we give you any buy or sell uh, call for any of the counters. So if you decide to buy anything, you do it at your own risk. Okay, today we are just exploring some of the companies with you and we do it on a educational purpose and case studies only. And uh, of course, our Bursa webinar series, we have done a lot of webinars. So far today, we are at the eighth topic since the early of this year, how to invest in turnaround stock. We still have two more to come in next month and in December. So make sure you stay, stay until the end of the webinar series. And maybe next year we have, we'll roll out more for you. So without further ado, let me introduce our speaker today. If you have followed through our previous webinar, uh, he shouldn't be uh, very strange to you because he has been helping us with all our uh, webinars so far. And today he's going to hear to talk about how to invest in turnaround stock. And he has 20 over years of experience investing and, uh, and also um, and working for several public companies. company. So his name is PC Wong. So now I want to give control over to PC. Yeah. All right. Hi. Give me a minute, uh, huh? you. I changed presenter to you. All right. Okay. You may share your slide now. Yeah. Okay. Done. Uh, thank you, Shane, and uh, thank you to all listeners who are tuning in. Um, well, let's uh, talk about uh, investing in turnaround stock. Uh, today we'll discuss about the definition of a turnaround stock and um, understand the characteristic of turnaround stocks, how deterioration can occur in a company, learn the risks and rewards of investing in turnaround stocks, learn to identify turnaround stocks, and learn to select those with the best possible chance of survival. Now, definition of a turnaround stock. It is a stock of a company which has entered into a phase of weak performance, but has the potential to change its course as management arrests issues affecting its performance, 
and or a change in circumstance or government policy that will alter the company's uh, fortunes uh, positively. Now, um, one very good example of a turnaround stock is the uh, um, uh, on the international uh, scene is actually Nokia. Um, although Nokia now is not doing too well, but uh, during the uh, 1990s, Nokia used to be a furniture company, uh, nothing to do with mobile phone, and then they shifted over into uh, into the uh, uh, mobile phone business. So that's why some sometimes a turnaround company uh, may actually change its business model altogether. So characteristics of a turnaround stock. Um, there are three stages of a turnaround stock. Um, on the very bottom, it is the uh, earnings, uh, weakness, and rapid deterioration. That's when the uh, company, after many quarters of, um, of uh, failure to beat expectations or many quarters of losses, then we see rapid deterioration of the stock price. Yeah, the share price would drop quite drastically as inv investors bail out of the company, uh, losing confidence in the management of the company. Now, this after a prolonged situation, there may come a, a circumstance where there could be a change in management, okay, or a change in the business model. And that is the second phase where there will be execution of turnaround plans, okay. Um, normally during this phase, the management would come out to be very uh, uh, proactive and they would highlight uh, what's been done, okay, uh, detail their execution plans as well as completed plans uh, to the investors so that uh, the investors would once again gain confidence in the company. Yeah, and then uh, the last stage would be improvement and monitoring. Once the execution of plans are very fruitful, okay, the management then would have to look for further improvement from the base as well as monitoring results so that um, they are able to uh, improve the company much further. So these are the three main stages, okay, of a turnaround stock. Now, stage one, uh, there'll be weaknesses across the board where there will be weak earnings or losses over a long period, poor cash flow from operating activities, okay? Um, despite uh, company, um, sometimes we see company uh, being very, very desperate, okay? They double down on their debt, okay, to, to, to expand the business, okay? But it could be that the business model is you know, in a sunset industry. And then uh, they, despite what they are doing, the company would not be able to turn around, yeah? So this would, uh, during that stage, the company would often have poor cash flow from the operating activities, yeah? And then there'll be poor balance sheet, which may require further fundraising, okay? You will see that the, uh, um, the current liabilities uh, uh, are very high, okay? But the current assets are not enough to sustain okay, that commitment over the 12 month period. So that's why they will require to uh, raise fund or they will issue uh, new shares. And this would actually push the company share price even lower due to dilution. And as the share price uh, continue to depress versus the peers in the same industry, investors would actually bail out, okay. They will, that company will be shunned by all investors. So. Uh, this is the uh, stage one where is um, where we see very often. And uh, one example um, again, um, if you all remember uh, Kodak, Kodak used to be a a, a very well known uh, film company. But when they failed to change into digital, okay, Kodak uh, eventually de um, declared bankruptcy because their turnaround plans didn't work. Yeah, so uh, some international. Uh, examples here uh, which I share and stage two um, execution of turnaround plans now during this stage a new management could come in okay or there could be a new investor sometimes called a white knight okay that comes in and there'll be fresh capital injection okay uh, that um, sometimes it may not necessarily be a, 
uh, fundraising, borrowing, borrowing even more debt, but it could be someone who is um, coming in, okay, there may be a major dilution, but that person, that, that investor is actually uh, putting his money into the company to secure uh, a substantial amount of the shares. So uh, this is, uh, of course, will cause dilution, but then uh, when you have a, a pedigree investor, okay, or well-known investor coming in to, uh, to take a substantial stake in the company, then uh, you would see that uh, confidence would start to um, would start to come in, okay. And also um, during this stage, okay, the uh, the uh, management would have to, if let's say the uh, uh, major investor comes in, the management would have to allocate, you know, a place for the new investor in the in the board, yeah, in the board of directors. If let's say his stake is very substantial. Yeah, and then the next stage would be about reducing debt and liabilities because often uh, poor cash flow and uh, uh, very poor ratios and very poor balance sheet is a result of, uh, of, of a company being overburdened with debt, okay? And the assets are insufficient yeah, to actually meet that kind of uh, uh, liabilities, um, whether it's current or on a longer term basis. So um, it could also, comes with a change in management, okay? Certain, uh, the older management, okay? Uh, including those uh, from the, uh, maybe the C CEO or CFO, okay? Or COO may be asked to leave the company, okay? And during this change of management, new blood would come in with new ideas and new uh, dynamism, okay? To put into the company. So it is also at this stage, that the management will unveil um, turnaround plans for the business and set deadlines for execution of plans. What is this? So, when the during the turnaround stage, it's very important for the management to detail to the investor what they are going to do, how they are going to do it, and the deadline when they will do it and what is the outcome that they are expecting, okay? Now, if you have a company that change your management, you know, a company that changes the management, but the management is, instead of, you know, arresting the problem immediately uh, by, by detailing the plans, but they are dragging their feet, okay? For example, you know, this, uh, this company has a new change of management, but the management did not immediately come up with plans within the fastest time possible. Then it goes to show that the management is also dragging their feet and therefore may not be able to execute the plans that are required to turn the company around. Okay, very importantly, the management must be very proactive towards the investors' uh, needs, such as um, information and you know, it's very important for them to make the necessary announcement of successful executions of plans within the specified deadline. Okay, it's no point that the management detail a plan that says that um, we are going to reduce our gearing, you know, by 50%. Okay, but then but then the uh, uh, what what happens then is that you know, they have this plan, but they did not specify um, uh, when they want to do it, okay? So then it becomes, you know, a wishful uh, thinking, okay? So if there's a deadline, then we then investors must hold the management to that execution within that deadline. So if that deadline expires without any execution, then that would, also show that the management is very weak in implementing their plans, yeah? So um, look for first signs of improvement in income statement, balance sheet, and cash flow position. Now, these are the very beginnings, okay, of uh, the company moving away from its deterioration state. During stage three, um, there must be consistent improvement in the income statement, balance sheet, and cash flow position. There's no point that in one quarter, the 
company actually uh, managed to turn cash flow into positive income statement have a revenue that grow you know uh, instead of uh, of negative growth they have positive growth balance sheet uh, ratios are improving okay but then the following uh, after the first two quarters the third quarter it started to deteriorate back again so um, to be able to become really a turnaround company okay it must be there must be consistent improvement throughout okay and not you know that is haphazard you know sometimes it's up sometimes it's down okay and very importantly that the management are dynamic enough to realize that the immediate target has been reached okay they have executed their plans within the specified deadline now is the time the management to become brave and revises their targets on the upside okay if let's say you know because the company is starting from a very low bottom by right every agreement will actually push the company away from that bottom and therefore you know it should be continuous revision on the high side but if management suddenly become very conservative you know and you know and the company has not moved away from that bottom then it goes to show that management are not very not very dynamic okay and they are they don't have a clear cut um a long-term plan to push the company further and further away from the bottom so at the end okay if everything fall into place the company must come out of its predicament stronger and with improved efficiency that will then translate to better earnings okay and better cash cash flow position now why invest in turnaround stocks of course um, it presents the ideal opportunity for investors who have a contrarian view or, and the patience to see their investment comes into fruition which in some cases could be in high multiples of the original price okay now this means to say that um, if let's say you that company you know has been in the doldrums but somehow you feel that due to changing circumstance or changing um, changing government policy or a management that is beginning to show okay some signs of improvement therefore you decide to become a contrarian okay whereas other people would actually not touch this stock you come in and start buying it at the low price okay so when when the company is at the very low price here yeah, and then you know you start to see that improvement are in place then the share price will actually move higher and as the uh, third stage okay of the turnaround uh situation yeah it becomes very 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 profitable then you know it could be on the high multiples of the original price because you buy it okay because you bought it near the bottom so that is the uh, advantage okay in investing in turnaround stocks but that's also the risk because you do not know whether the first sign of improvement is going to be long lasting or not so that therefore it's very important for you to weigh your risk okay and not to go too heavily into it okay you can accumulate gradually okay and increase your investment into that company so uh, one thing we need to understand is how a deterioration in a company can occur now sometimes it can occur when there's a prolonged bear market in a specific um, industry or market which results in the company uh, delivering poor earnings you know for example um, a prolonged raw materials bear market that impacts both the raw materials industry and dry bulk business okay um, as you are aware of okay during the uh, severe bear market in the raw materials industry the Baltic index actually fell to less than 300 points and therefore impacting the uh, dry bulk business okay and a lot of shipping companies that are in the dry bulk business suffer tremendous losses because the Baltic index is a measurement of the shipping rates that people are willing to pay okay to ferry the goods to another place okay when it's you know when it falls to less than 300 you know it's you know it, it means that people are not willing to to pay that kind of uh, shipping rate okay and therefore those shipping companies do suffer heavy losses yeah um, 
you know, there, there, there was a time um, uh, when the Baltic index was above 10,000 points, okay? And then when you see that it drops below 3,000, uh, I mean, 300 points, you know, that's, you know, 90 over percent, you know, fall in the shipping rates, yeah? So the other thing is the failure of the community to change with the times, such as a move into the digital age, and I shared with you just now, Kodak, okay? Or a change in consumer preference, which affect the company's business model. Now, sometimes certain companies, they believe that, you know, they have been doing the same business for decades, okay? And then, you know, they become very complacent, yeah? And they believe that their business model did not change because it has been proven successful in the past. But because we live in such a fast moving world right now, because that's the internet, that's the discovery of new technology, uh, new payment system, okay? And currently the hottest thing is actually cryptocurrency and blockchain here, yeah? which they say is going to be the next big thing uh, after the internet. So when, when you have uh, this kind of change in technology, Okay, some company uh, still maintain the same old business model, then you may see that people will flock to a company that's offer that kind of uh, uh, better service and efficiency versus um, previously, and therefore that company would fail. Yeah, because technology changes very fast. Okay, and if a company is not able to change in line, they can also fail. Now, the other thing is poor management, okay, especially uh, management who still believe in the good times, but not having the vision to see further into the future, okay, and therefore we, we say that the management has fallen behind the times, okay, due to over complacency um, of previous successes or a lack of wisdom and vision to see a company through difficult times. So sometimes we have management who are very gung-ho you know when times are good okay then they start to take up a lot of debt okay and then they want to increase the business as you know through expansion and acquisition especially acquisition through debt but then accumulation of debt somehow or rather is not free money further down the road the company will have to pay so sometimes company uh, a, a company management would you know feel that by acquiring a bigger company, okay, by using borrowed money, huge amount of debt, okay, that bigger company would actually help them to expand their revenue base and um, net profit. But sometimes it's not that case, okay, especially if they they are fighting with a few different type of a uh, few competitors to acquire that company, so they might overbid in price. Okay, so there are circumstances where a company may overbid, okay? They may overbid in acquiring a company and on top of that, sometimes that overbidding, you pay a high price, but you also absorb the company, the, 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 you know, the company's debt. So when this happens and when climate change, business climate change, then that company would be able to, uh, would, would see that, not only is the revenue falling, but they already incurred such a huge borrowing cost. Yeah, so that's why sometimes management they keep on looking at expansion and and acquisition, but they fail to detect something that could actually um, shake the economic environment and may cause them to um, not realize the kind of uh, um, intention that they wanted to see by acquiring. Um, another company yeah so um very importantly management must be able to balance the risk okay but some management are too gung-ho and then later that company you know uh falls fat on its face so let's look at the commodities bear market and in this example we look at maybach now this is the uh for the bloomberg commodity index okay um based on a five-year chart okay you can see that this is the uh, almost two year bear market yeah, in the commodity prices. But then you look again at Maybach. Now again, Maybach is, is, um, is involved in shipping uh, raw materials, the dry bulk business. Yeah. You can see that you know, the trend line is almost 
quite similar to the commodity index. Yeah. So if let's say you are interested in May bulk, you know, the, the two things that you must always look at, one is the commodity index, the other is the Baltic index, because um, if the commodity index detects a higher price, then likelihood the Baltic index would actually move higher. And therefore, you know, uh, that could uh, um, indicate that uh, Maybach could achieve better revenue uh, moving forward. Okay, you can see that it's almost identical. Yeah. Now, then we see this uptick here. Okay, and then there's another uptick here, but now it's moving along this range. So uh, we have to ask ourselves, is this a turnaround? Okay, so later we will analyze and see whether it is worthwhile or not to, to, to uh, study uh, Maybach as an option for investment. Then let's look at technology and M3 tech's business model. You see that um, M3 tech is also going down. Okay, and then there's some signs that is moving up. Okay, again, okay, uh, we have to ask whether this is a turnaround or not. Now, one thing is that um, uh, M3 Tech provides multiple mobile platforms for the consumer besides sales of technology based equipment. Now, technology is something that is very different because um, anyone who is in the technology business, especially M3 Tech, you are not only competing with. Um, uh, businesses, okay, that's within Malaysia, but you are competing with world of giants within the same industry. Now, for example, okay, um, if let's say M3 Tech offer mobile platform, okay, there are bigger companies that offer mobile platforms, okay, that are free, okay, um, and then you know between one that is paid and between one that is free, again there will be competition, okay, just as um, in terms of uh, e-commerce, okay, like uh, right now Alibaba is coming in very big into Malaysia, okay. So will Alibaba take up very big percentage of the e-commerce uh, 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 segment in Malaysia, and therefore affecting the smaller players? Because when giants come in, okay, uh, competition will be very keen, and if let's say our local company cannot compete with the bigger giants when they come in, then you will see gradual uh, decline in terms of uh, revenue and sales, okay? Just as, um, as an example, um, to digress a bit, um, you can see that um, in, the, in the retailing sector, okay? For example, clothing, we have H&M coming in, we have Zara coming, coming in, Okay, then we have um, uh, a number of other brands overseas that have moved into Malaysia. Now, then you compare whether um, one, one of Malaysia better well-known brands, let's say Padini, have Padini actually moved outside of Malaysia into, uh, like HMM is from Sweden, have Padini moved into Europe or not? Okay, when the local company cannot move overseas, but you have overseas moving into the local industry, then likelihood you will see that um, uh, there'll be there'll be a lot of competition, okay, and the opportunity for the for that local brand to grow further, okay, would be rather limited once they've reached a certain critical mass, unless they move away, okay, to look at newer markets because all the big brands are actually coming in and they come in very strongly, yeah. So uh, this is something that. Uh, uh, for you to think about, yeah. So, financially distressed, delisting, and bankruptcy. Now, these are the feelings of the management. Okay, you uh, if a management says at any time that the company is where it is in its poor state is due to circumstances, then that management should not be running that company. Okay, because. If a company ever becomes financially distressed and facing the uh, facing the listing and bankruptcy, it's never the the circumstance that cause it. Rather, it's the failing of the management. Because if the management uh, have the foresight, they would be able to make prevention or prepare for a circumstance that suddenly arise. 
that are uh, sorry make preparation for a circumstance that might arise and when that circumstance arise they are they have in their plans how to effect um uh, effect corrective measures okay to turn around the situation so always remember the company is not a victim of circumstance but of management failure to address weakness and the potential dangers that lies ahead okay so the management may say a lot of things okay but that is actually putting the blame on others okay but not themselves so among the causes is management concept of listing is to earn a quick buck and using public funds for personal gains okay so this is quite common to uh to a lot of companies yeah especially i think uh um not only in malaysia but other uh, uh, other places as well um even to that extent in us yeah so management wants to lease a company okay because they want to make a quick buck and after they list the company, they would use the public funds, okay, for personal projects. For example, um, you know, they use the public fund for construction of their of 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 a of a of a plan, okay. But then someone in the board of director owns a construction owns a construction company, and that project is given to that um, to to that director's. Uh, uh, company so that's why this is cost siphoning of public funds yeah which is not good then there's over indebtedness because of borrowing because the cost of borrowing is cheap but beyond the company's ability to pay so uh, um, especially during the um, normally during the economic crisis the bank would actually lower interest rate so then companies uh, would go on a borrowing binge okay because they have cheap credit so they borrow a lot of money okay in thinking that okay this would help in their cash flow and so on but once the economy starts to recover normally the bank will actually increase interest rate then if the company is unable to service that debt that they borrow at a higher interest rate to pay for that which they borrow at a lower interest rate so uh, this could actually happen then um, we have management Whose focus only on the stock price action and not on the more basic stuff such as the equity, revenue, and net profit growth. Okay, so uh, for example, you know, uh, previous webinar we, we talked about Nestle. Okay, Nestle have a very poor gearing. Okay, their debt to equity ratio is uh, more than two. Okay, then um, because they have a tremendous debt. Therefore, their equity is very low. But when they announce their result, okay, their return on equity is very high. You know, it's hundred over, it's about hundred over percent. So, but then it based on a very small equity. Rather, you know, because the management just want to, wants one, uh, wants to tell people, hey, you know, our stock pays a very good dividend. Okay, our return on equity is very high, and therefore the price now is at eighty eight ringgit. Okay, but then. If the equity is very small, by right, the management should actually grow the equity so that eventually your debt to equity ratio is down. Okay. And, you know, rather than just focus on return on equity, of course, um, the revenue and net profit growth uh, is just as equally important because it has to do with the, uh, uh, the company uh, cash flow. Okay. And also, uh, retained profits can actually help. Um, increase the equity yeah so that's why sometimes management whatever they do is just to boost the stock price okay so for example some we have situation whereby you know previously there's a company um, um, one example is that that company is actually losing money and its share price is not doing too well then that company suddenly announced we are going to pay a very good dividend so then the next question is if you are losing money where is that money coming from to pay the dividend okay so by right if you have positive earnings then only you get uh, you have a certain percentage of the earnings to be given as dividend so when you have losses but then you are still going to pay a big dividend means the company will have to borrow money now when you have situation where 
a company suddenly announced paying a good dividend despite having losses, you should not buy that company. Okay, because whatever they pay that dividend is not enough to pay for your entire investment in that company. Okay, so don't fall for that because normally you have if you have a situation like this, it is the top management who are going to cash out. Okay, they want the stock price to increase so that they can cash out. Okay, their investment. So um, when a management focus too much on the price action they would lose focus on the very basic necessities of improving that company in terms of productivity, efficiency, and the bottom line. Okay, so be careful about all this. So then, of course, um, risk of investing in a turnaround stock. Um, company may go under or fall into bankruptcy if new strategies to arrest the decline fail. Now, this is the uh, one thing you need to be really clear, okay? When you buy a stock, okay, at the very, near the very bottom, okay, it may not necessarily show that the turnaround plan is going to be successful, but then the risk will be higher and so will the return, okay? But if let's say the, the new strategies do not, are not able to arrest the decline, okay, then, it falls further and potentially it could wipe off your entire investment. Okay, especially when that company has reached a stage where there's no other option but to delist. Okay. Then of course the opportunity cost in holding the investment for a longer than projected period because a turnaround plan would not happen in one or two quarters. Sometimes it could last two to three years, okay, to really see the fruition of your investment. Okay. But of course, during the intermittent stage. From from there to the to to that potential, there's um, ample opportunity to trade if you are not a long-term investors. Um, so during the restructuring process, there could be more dilution of shares. Yeah, because the company um, need to if a company is already heavily indebted, there's no point for that company to borrow at an interest rate. Okay, to pay off that which also requires interest rate. So what will likely happen that company will issue more shares, okay, to a new investors, or they will issue more shares to actually pay off their debt. Then there'll be, a, um, there'll be a lot of dilution, okay, and the share price could be pressured very, very low, okay, because normally in a restructuring process, if the company is heavily indebted, there's no other options except to dilute the shareholder ba shareholding base here. Yeah. Okay, so uh, uh, you can see your investment fall further in terms, uh, in terms of dilution. Okay, then of course, there's emotional stress as things could become worse before they become better. So during the initial stage, there, there could be a, a lot of roller coaster kind of uh, emotional stress here. Sometimes you think that it's, it's, you know, it's on the right track, but then certain things comes in because there's a whole, there's a whole lot of problems um, when the company is at rock bottom, okay? When the management may overcome, you know, a few in that specified deadline, a new problem may crop out later, okay? So it could be uh, tremendous emotional stress when you're holding onto that particular stock. Then the rewards of investing, okay? During the restructuring phase, any dilution, of course, is, a, is an opportunity to buy, allowing the investor to accumulate shares at low value, yeah? The transformation could result in the company changing its business model, exposing the company to a whole new market or opportunities. So sometimes a company may, may, may see that um, an opportunity okay, may arise, and then that company may decide that, hey, you know, let's uh, shift our attention into this segment. Okay. So then they will actually move their resources to that segment and grow that segment, okay? And which sometimes may be uh, a, good, um, a good strategy because it opened up a whole new market of opportunities, yeah? Then the returns, of course, could be astro astronomical as the company swings from loss to profit ahead of schedule. So very importantly, um, the, price, the, price, the share price could actually move up quite fast Okay, if let's say whatever the management did, okay, 
flow actually is um, whatever the management does is always ahead of schedule okay and they are able to um, able to actually deliver um, good results okay um, projected supposed to be by the fourth quarter of the year they are able to move into positive territory by the second quarter of the year so then this could actually move the share price very quickly but to do so the management need to be very dynamic yeah so how do we identify a turnaround stock of course you have to look for signs of a turnaround then okay there's emergence of optimism from a prolonged bear market which could change the fortunes of a company okay so um just now we talk about maybach so would actually um the commodities index moving higher could it you know change the fortunes of maybach later we'll we'll discuss okay or when the new management takes over the over or the removal of previous key personnel such as the ceo cfo or coo okay so normally when the older management from the previous batch are removed then it's a sign that, that the company wants new blood into the business uh, into managing the company so the, um then it's very important that this new management team offers a new turnaround plan and vision is revealed okay they must tell the investors what is their vision okay they set deadlines for achievement of specific targets rather than just uh, saying that we will do this we do this okay a lot of smoke and mirrors but then there's no specific dates okay so improvement in earnings and balance sheet but must be proven to be sustainable okay so like i say it, it must not be just one or two quarters okay but then it's follow through the third fourth uh, for, uh, fourth quarter and then the following financial year yeah very importantly a turnaround stock must be supported by financial data not the price action in the stock because the financial data are the underlying fundamentals okay sometimes that price action could be a lot of uh, um, could be just enthusiasm new management comes in that's an enthusiasm that it would actually um, um, able to turn things around then you see a certain spike but then after a while okay the financial data does not support it and then you see the stock price fall back again okay so very importantly okay the financial data must be consistent so let's study um, uh, Maybach and M3 tech now the revenue growth okay for Maybach is 24.6 percent okay year on year okay M3 tech uh, is still negative net loss um, reduction year year on year okay uh, maybe able to reduce the net, net loss by 35.1 percent m3 tech 41.6 percent the current ratio at 0 0.72 uh, m3 tech at 5.68 now here you see that um, uh, m3 tech has very strong current ratio and they have very low uh, debt to equity ratio okay whereas maybe their current ratio is uh, is uh not enough okay the current assets not enough to meet that 12 months commitments yeah but their debt to equity ratio is uh, reasonable at 0 0.45 um eps um not able to give uh, because it's negative yeah um not applicable yeah dividend also not applicable share price um may about at 84 cents m3 tech at 10 cents dividend yield also not applicable net asset value per share okay maybach is 0 0.63 m3 tech is 0 0.09 okay nine cents um so we have the uh share price over the net asset value per share for maybach at 1.33 and m3 tech at 1.04 um p ratio not possible not applicable because it's negative it's not positive uh change in operating cash flow both are positive return on equity uh Maybach return is negative here, yeah? it's 13.1 percent, whereas uh, M3 tech at 3.36 percent. Now, on paper, uh, it may be seen that uh, M3 tech uh, uh, has a stronger balance sheet, but um, let's explore a bit further. Now, if we use use uh, a KPI measurement, okay, that revenue growth year on year must be more than 5 percent. M3 tech fails, but Maybach able to achieve more than five percent net loss reduction okay um more than ten percent 
Okay, net loss reduction uh, here is supposed to be more than 10%, uh, which uh, Maybank is a yes and M3 type is also a yes. Okay, current ratio of more than one. Okay, Maybank fails, uh, whereas M3 type pass, debt to equity ratio less than 1.5, both pass. Dividend yield, uh, neither have any dividend. Net asset value per share less than three. Uh, both are actually below three. Okay, so Maybank and M3 Tech have the same score of four yes and four no, but which is a better company? Now, very importantly, um, that KPI measurement is something like a methodology, a quantitative method. Um, later on, you need to dissect. If the score are the same, you need to go deeper into the details, okay? And study the underlying fundamentals. Um, for Maybank, price recovery in commodities and raw materials, at least we see it in the uh, commodities index. Gains in the Baltic index, which is aging towards 1,500 points from a low of 291 in February 12. Okay, so uh, you can see that uh, the shipping rate is improving, okay? And at 1,500 points is a far cry from you know, 291. Okay, then we could see further improvement in revenue and reduction in net loss, okay, because of improving uh, shipping rates, okay, and uh, recovery in the commodities market. Okay, Q on Q, uh, quarter on quarter improvement in revenue and reduction in net loss. Okay, debt to equity ratio is low. allowing the company to borrow to meet its current liabilities commitments. So um, its debt to equity ratio is not very, uh, it's not staggering, staggeringly high. So that would allow Maybox to actually uh, borrow uh, to meet the current liabilities commitment. Okay, and that's uh, support in the share price. So M3 tech fundamentals, Okay, technology-based business are often competitive in a cutthroat manner, requiring high volume of sales to turn in a profit. Okay, this is what happens in a lot of technology. Yeah, um, you have to go for high volume because the margin is normally squeezed. And not only that, um, when you have certain technology improvement, whatever um, items that you have of a lower technology base, they will actually be obsolete. Okay, so quarter on quarter result remains murky with increase in revenue and net loss. So on one hand, um, revenue did increase quarter on quarter, but the net loss also widened. Yeah, continued disposal of large quantities of shares by insider is not inspiring, no confidence boosting. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of disposal of uh, shares uh, by the insiders in the company. So um, if let's say the company is really doing very well, why are the... Uh, uh, insiders who are the major shareholders, you know, they are actually uh, disposing their shares. Okay, so this is definitely something that is not very um, inspiring, yeah, for investors to buy into the company. Okay, and not only that, the management did not reveal much about the mobile platform business nor plans to increase users in their uh, quarterly report. They just they tell a lot about their uh, their display platform, their display, um, their display equipment, okay? But because they also have a number of um, mobile apps, you know, they, they never say anything about, about it, how to increase users and so on. So um, when it's only hype on something that, you know, that is, uh, that, that is their best seller, okay? But not other segments of the business, then I think that, you know, it's not very confidence boosting either. Yeah. yeah, you know, if a company is really doing very well, you know, it should not be doing well in just one segment. It should be doing well uh, in a multiple of segments, okay? So when you just have one segment that suddenly you say this is your most important segment, you know, you are looking at boosting sales and so on, okay? But because you also have a lot of uh, uh, mobile platform, but there's nothing, you know, in the report that reveals what the management wants to do to increase its users. So is, is it that the management is, is changing their focus? Okay. So this, this um, has more questions than answers. So in this case, okay, I will look at Maybell as being a more promising um, uh, characteristics of a turnaround stock. Okay. 
But one thing, because the commodities market may be choppy and global economy could return to recession level due to the immense money printing and unsustainable debt, it is best to adopt a careful approach. Yeah. Although the commodities market is showing some improvement and the Baltic index actually is showing much higher shipping rates. Okay. Bear in mind that um, uh, worldwide, okay, the global debt you know, has already reached the highest on record okay and there's a lot of money printing uh going about and there's a lot of asset bubbles uh throughout the global market so uh if there's any severe correction then that could impact uh the economy quite drastically so um if you if you are interested in maybout do monitor the baltic index uh as guide for the price action yeah so key points in investing in a turnaround stock Revenue and net profit may fall or even net loss may occur, but what keeps the company afloat is its financial strength. Okay, always remember that. Study the balance sheet, ensure the important ratios are not raising any red flags. Yeah, so fundamentals must improve and financial data must indicate improvement, not the price action in the share price. Okay, look for improvement in the financial data. The share price improvement comes along with the improvement in financial data if let's say the financial data does not support that improvement in the share price means something is wrong and it could be due to over speculation yeah so the last thing is be patient okay q a session okay so we have um, come to the Q&A session so we are now opening the floor for questions all right so if any question you can uh, put it down and uh, in the meantime uh, let me take back the uh, just give me a minute uh. let me take back the uh, control PC All right, so the first question that we have here is what percentage would you recommend to allocate for a turnaround stock in a portfolio? I think if you are looking at a potential return of multiples, you need not invest in a very huge um, amount as a percentage of your portfolio. Um, it depends on the risk taking, but assuming that a turnaround stock can eventually deliver, let's say, um, two to three times, then maybe a 10% allocation would do because when it really turns around and you see that multiples in gain, it could, it could uh, transform a, a bigger portion of your portfolio. So um, don't go too heavily into it, okay, because uh, the risks are still there, yeah. Um, I, I, I would suggest at around there, but again, it's up to you uh, whether uh, you really find a very good turnaround stock and you want to add on to your investment gradually, okay? So initial stage, okay, maybe. Okay, so um, can you compare Maybao with his competitor? Likewise, can you also compare M3 Tech with, this, with his peers? Hello. Can you hear me, PC? Can you all hear me? Test, test, test. Can you all hear me? Oops, I think our organizer has no PC has maybe got some internet issue at his side. So can I please hold on for a minute uh, while I think he comes online? Just give me a minute, alright? So um so to sum up, I think what he meant is that it depends on the risk taking ability for allocation of turnaround stock on your portfolio. If you are a bit more risk taker, of course you can have more. If you are lesser of a risk taker, you can have a bit lesser of the portfolio. Oh, PC, are you back online now? Yeah. 
All right. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on. That's a slight disruption. Yeah. Yeah. Are you okay? Have you done with the? Are you done with the first question? Yeah. Okay. And then yeah. let me go on with the second question. Uh. can you compare yeah. Mei Bao yeah. with his competitor and also entry type with his peers? Uh? That's the next question. Um, I think most importantly, sorry. Yeah. Sorry? That's the question. Uh. Would you be can, able to compare? Can you repeat Mei the question? Bao? Would you be able to compare Mei Bao with his uh, peers and also entry type with his peers? I think yes, you can compare, okay, with uh, peers within the same industry. But here, I'm just drawing out uh, a single stock. But if you really want to compare whether um, which which of the, for example, Maybach is Maybach growing at a faster rate compared to other peers? Then, if so, then that would actually uh, reinforce your the the uh, the attractiveness of Maybach. But if let's say other peers are performing better than Maybach, then you might not want to put your money into Maybell as yet. Yeah, this is just an example. Very importantly, you need to compare with other peers. Mm. Okay, so um, so the next question is, what measurement can indicate a strong possible turnaround stock other than financial report and chairman analyst report? I think. The financial report will always be something that will tell you the underlying fundamentals. But if let's say you want to look at certain change, okay, for example, um, like those that are that are related to certain other indicators, for example, like I share with you, Maybell, okay, for example, an uptick in the commodities market, an uptick in the Baltic index, then that would immediately uh, transmit the indicators that you wanted to know. Okay, that the industry is actually improving. Okay, just as, um, for example, if you are, if if let's say, um, uh, in the, uh, uh, assuming at the bottom, uh, there's a property market uh, crash, like in during the uh, year two thousand eight. Okay, so what do we know? Uh, that there'll be a boost in the property market. So when the bank decides, when the central bank, Bank of Ghana decides to lower interest rate further, so then this might be the kind of indicator that shows that, hey, you know, it will actually support the, uh, the uh, property market uh, going forward. So uh, look for those external indicators as the, as the prime mover. Yeah. Okay, awesome. So, um, hang on, yeah. So usually for the deadline, yeah, how long time does it take to achieve the specific result is considered like acceptable for the turnaround stock? I think the um, much depends on the uh, current economic situation. For example, if let's say uh, it hits the uh, um, like right now, a lot of, there's a lot of um, um, Asset bubbles everywhere. So, if let's say there's a huge correction, money wouldn't just disappear. Okay, money would move into certain areas that are actually in a bear market. So that's why there's a lot of uh, uh, economies and 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 uh, and analysts are saying that if let's say there's certain huge correction, okay, most likely it will move into those. Uh, industry that are currently uh, have not reached an asset uh, bubble yet. Okay, most likely in the commodity industry. Okay, or in the next, uh, if the next bubble bursts, maybe it will flow. Money will flow into emerging economies. So these are something that you can uh, think about. Okay, and 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 look for certain pointers. Yeah. Okay, so is DRB Highcom considered a good candidate for turnaround stock? Um, most importantly, look at um, the coming financials. Yeah, because there's a lot of shift uh, in the in the in the recent uh, news. Okay, but to look for certain certain um, uh, indicators, for example, better uh, better sales or better uh, or a reduction in in the expenses and all those as the first signs of turnaround. Yeah, it must be some improvement, okay? Not just uh, rely on the news that comes out. Okay, 
So the next question is, how many quarters of improvement do you think would be reasonable before you take a serious look at the stock and how do you do evaluation for such a stock? If let's say we, we will never know the bottom, okay? So that's why you will own, if let's say you, if you are scanning certain certain stocks, yeah? Um, if the, the price action detects that uh, shows that the stock is coming out okay from its near from its uh, bottom then you might want to look deeper into this stock as a potential turnaround candidate but like i say the price action sometimes can be speculative and not due to underlying fundamentals but use the price action as something to help you decide uh which stock that you that 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 uh uh that you should start your analysis yeah Okay, so sometimes even though the stock meets all these turnaround criteria, but the share price drops further as the market doesn't have an eye on the stock, what should we do? Uh? Very importantly, you need to have that kind of, uh, again, the financial data. Now, sometimes to, uh, a company um, that is fallen down to the bottom, okay, they might show improvement in their financials, but because it has been in the bottom for so long, investors are just not interested, okay? So that share price, despite its uh, fundamentals are improving, may not see any retail participation or even institutional participation in buying into that stock, okay? But I think if, as long as the fundamentals are there, it will, you know, it will actually grow in terms of uh, equity and so on and sooner or later people would um, institution and other investors would come in and support it so um, if let's say that particular stock is very low value and you know and it's supported by strong fundamentals then that could be your value stock okay instead of a turnaround stock it then you know becomes a value stock already okay so you have to you know there could be this kind of change sometimes when a company has been you know doing badly for um, consecutive quarters, people just lose interest. And that is the opportune time for you to buy into that company just as the fundamentals are showing important indicate, uh, indicative signals uh, of improvement. Yeah. Okay, so how closely is Bauti Index uh, correlated with the commodities? Are there any examples of other influences for other category of stock? For example, property, like what index correlate with which property and what index correlate with technology, etc.? Um, more specifically, because um, the Baltic Index is, after all, about shipment of dry, dry raw materials um, in the commodity market. So that's why the, the two would actually give you a better indicator. Okay. So um, if let's say um, a particular company that is doing very, uh, very poorly. Okay. Let's say uh, in the uh, vehicle. Uh, in the auto industry, okay, in the vehicle uh, industry. Now, then uh, one thing that you should look at is what is the uh, volume of car sales, okay, that comes out um, and where this particular company rank in that, in that volume. Is it a majority are actually foreign owned or the local brand actually is, you know, is somewhere in, uh, somewhere on the top five, you know, this will be indicators yeah, so always look for those reports that help you to um, to make a better decision. All you need to do is actually Google, Google, you know, you can Google for whatever data, you know, all sorts of things will come out. Yeah, you have to be an active participant in doing the research, you know, and not just rely on newspaper telling you something about it. So if you have certain, certain interest in a particular stock, do find out all about it, okay? So, um, uh, for example, if let's say there's there's uh, there's um, uh, in the technology sphere, okay, read as much as you can, okay. Um, uh, what are the new uh, what what are the new technology, okay? If that company is um, is in the uh, in the uh, e-commerce, who are the big players that are coming in, okay? Then you will you will be, you will be able to have some indication, yeah. Okay, so um, the next question is on, uh, do we have 
a sector that is quick or that is slow in turn around during economic turn around or not? Do you understand mm. the question? Like any, yeah, other, think, any sector that uh, yeah. responds quickly to the turnaround and any sector that responds slowly to the turnaround in terms of economic changes? If let's say there's, um, I, I think the commodities market is something that, that will show a very uh, uh, quick when it starts to move up. Yeah. For example, the bear market in the, in the commodities, you know, is almost two years. But as it moves up, okay certain commodities are actually moving up very very fast okay so um things like um uh so that's why when you look at the commodity index you can you can go to certain certain um materials that is related to our uh, country's economy for example uh oil palm okay um um uh things like uh uh steel um, things like, um, uh, for example, steel, then you will know that, hey, will, will it impact Malaysia steel uh, business because steel price is actually uh, moving higher. Okay, so these are the things that you can look at. The commodity index is something that uh, uh, that is um, been very badly hit, but there are certain commodities that have actually increased um, in prices over last year by 30 to, uh, you know, uh, 30 to 100 over percent especially but i don't think malaysia has but then uh, because of all the hype on uh, electric vehicles lithium is actually up 100 over percent uh, versus last year in terms of price then uh, cobalt because it's related with lithium battery cobalt is also have moved up 100 over percent okay so um, look for a certain breakdown that you think that you know that certain price uh, you know is moving up very fast then then of course that share uh, and that company which which is involved in that kind of industry will also move up very fast. Okay, try to uh, relate to that. Yeah. Okay, so um, where can we search for the Bauti index? Uh? is it global crude oil price and transportation index is relatively important to me about as well. Okay, you. Um, the most important thing is uh, related to Maybach is actually the Baltic dry, uh, uh, the Baltic dry bulk index, yeah. Because Maybach is actually a dry bulk carrier, not not the uh, oil oil carrier. Okay, but if let's say you want to look at things that is related to oil, that would actually um, um, uh, shows that uh, the oil industry is recovering on something. So oil price actually have now moved up. So uh, you can look at. Which are the industry? Which are the segment that has been hammered uh, during the last uh, two, two, two to three years? Okay. For example, um, now uh, this we will talk later uh, when we when we talk about oil and gas. But then uh, as a pre uh, prelude, you know, like Sapura um, um, Energy, okay, um, uh, um, or Dialog. Okay, Dialog is more is more into the. Uh, uh, storage okay whereas uh, others could be into the uh, into the uh, um, into the um, deep oil drilling so those that related into deep oil drilling uh, deep oil drilling would be would be uh, somewhat um, affected okay because um, a lot of companies are cutting away their capex in uh, exploration but dialogue because they are in a providing storage for oil as long as the oil price increase then the oil storage price will also increase yeah so something like that lah. yeah okay in terms of gearing and debt to equity ratio which figure do you consider reasonable for turnaround companies i think debt to equity ratio um, um, should be not uh, should be less than uh, 1.5, uh, 1.5. Why? Because um, uh, even better if let's say you can put it at one. Because the the as long as the gearing is is maintained below one, okay, uh, it greatly reduces the risk. But not but because companies often would actually borrow money and leverage. So I I often use the figure of 1.5. Yeah. But the current ratio must always be more than one, okay? Because the, the there must be the, the kind of current assets that they have must be more than sufficient 
to meet the 12 months commitments in the current liabilities. Mm. So the next question is on, uh, what is your thought on investing in a company warrants uh, instead of shares? Do they both work the same way? And what are the risks? Uh? I think for warrants is because there's an exercise um, expiry date. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it is very low price. And sometimes people get burned also because, because of the small price movement, they have to buy a big, um, big quantity. Um, then again, I, I would, uh, I'm, uh, um, this again is my own opinion. I prefer shares rather than warrants and, and, and all those because I, I want something that can give me a dividend. Yeah, okay. Okay. So it's entirely up to that, up to your own assessment of risk. Law. All right. So what are the key points that uh, we have to look at in the financial data in order to determine whether it is a potentially um, turnaround stock or not? I think you have to look at, um, now, very importantly, you have to look at quarter on quarter improvement. Okay. Because um, uh, if let's say the company is improving, it will always be better than last year. But um, it must, but to really show that this company is consistent for consistency sake, you need to look at quarter on quarter. For example, uh, Q3 should be better or, or equal to, uh, to, to, to Q2. Okay, and Q4 should be better than Q3. Okay, certain, certain consistency that shows you a growing trajectory. If let's say for a certain quarter, it may fall short, then the next quarter, it should actually be much better. Okay, then that, that shows a trajectory of improvement and consistency. Yeah. You mentioned about big brands on clothing coming to Malaysia and about Padini. How does this tie in with the topic of the night? Yeah? Um, so that was I, I think that um, was a lot of Malaysian retailers are still, uh, yeah. Uh, um, what what I what I mentioned just now is that um, just a comparison. Okay, that a lot of big brands are coming to Malaysia, but uh, not many Malaysian brands are actually moving to moving overseas. Therefore, uh, competition will be very intense. Okay, and certain Malaysia retail uh, companies may have a cap on their potential for further improvement because of that intense uh, competition. Okay, but not necessarily it relates to uh, uh, to Malaysia industry being being uh, at rock bottom because uh, a number of retailers are still doing quite well. But just to show that com competition can actually one day force those company into uh, into stagnation. Okay, because uh, of, of the intense competition, yeah. Mm, do you ever look at interest cover? That was another question. Um, not, not really, not really. I, I think, um, most importantly is that, um, the if the company fundamental is strong, okay, then your decision would be a less uh, risky undertaking, okay, to invest, okay. Um, it, it boils down to everything about financials, yeah. Okay, sure. So uh, what do you think is the difference between uh, investing in turnaround stocks and cigarette value investing? Now, you one one of course is definitely higher risk. Okay, uh, turnaround stock is uh is definitely higher risk because you do not know whether your decision to buy at the near bottom is correct or not. Like I say, the risks are very much higher. That company can still uh fail to meet its objectives. Okay, that that is why um going back to the first question, if you have identified a turnaround stock allocate just a small portion on it because likelihood the multiples will be much higher and therefore they can form a significant portion of your portfolio if if, if let's say the company managed to deliver the desired results now value investing is something that you want to see long-term growth okay with steady dividend okay in a turnaround stock in in the few uh in that two to three years until you see that kind of uh assuming it it 
assuming uh, it's able to meet its targets, it still needs about two to three years before you can see that kind of uh, um, uh, results here. Okay. Whereas in uh, a value stock would during those two or three years, they still be able to give you a dividend. Yeah. Okay, so what is your view on the current trend of oil and gas industry and related counters? The oil and gas industry has seen some improvement, okay, uh, in, the, in terms of pricing. Um, also mainly driven because of the uh, Russia and Saudi Arabia talk about reducing production. Now the, the price would not go much uh, will not go much higher. I think it will roughly remain around the max, maybe about 55 uh, in the middle, uh, in the medium term uh, to maybe about 60 uh, at the max. But in 20, 2018, all the way to 2020, there'll be a lot of bankruptcies uh, in the oil industry, especially in the US because um, a lot of those companies that invested in the shale oil, uh, they have uh, incurred tremendous debt. About 80% of their cash flow is used to finance their debt. Okay, so it's just so bad. Okay, now come 2020, uh, there'll be 200 billion of, uh, of uh, bond from, the, uh, from this shale uh, industry that will become due. So many of them could be, uh, could be in financially distressed by that time. So um, in the short term, um, if let's say um, uh, those counters in Malaysia that are directly linked to oil exploration, those would be much, uh, uh, you, you, won't see, you won't see tremendous um, uh, price, uh, price appreciation, okay? until such time that the shale industry in the US go bust. And then uh, that would remove uh, many millions of barrels of oil per day from the global market. And that could cause uh, oil to move up higher, but it is still about two to three years away. Okay. So um, if you are investing in, in uh, oil and gas counter, you need to have that kind of patience, but it is at this kind of price that uh, gives you the better value for money uh, going into the uh, longer term future, yeah. Okay, excellent. So, um, how do you do valuation for turnaround stock? Most importantly, I often rely on the uh, on the uh, uh, management. Um, now, initially, if let's say I want to move in early, yeah, okay. And if let's say I'm a risk taker, okay, I would see what the management intention are, what do they want to do, okay, how they want to do it, okay, and then they set a target. Now that is the first stage that normally you see a uh, management is serious in uh, wanting to turn things around. So based on that, I may want to make that initial investment, okay, but. Um, I know that I'm taking a big risk because things may not happen, okay? Then uh, if let's say fundamentals are showing some signs, then I'm a, I will add on to my position because initial position, if I lose, I lose, okay? But um, at least I'm, 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 I will uh, face up to that risk that I'm taking. But when financial data are showing improvement, then that's when I will accumulate more, okay? But I would not keep on buying all the way up it will be a certain time when I think, okay, it's enough. I don't think I want to invest anymore. Now it's just to watch it grow. Yeah. Okay. So is quarter on quarter earning per share or year on year earning per share improvement more important to you? Um, if let's say I'm looking at a very steady company, okay, I would look at um, year on year, okay. But in the turnaround company, they must be, a trajectory of improvement, okay, quarter on quarter because you want consistency. You want to see for signs of consistency, okay. Not that because if you if let's say things are already changing, every um, whatever quarter this year would be better than the previous quarter. Definitely, 
otherwise you know you better dump the stock all together that definitely will be much better okay but the thing is when improvements start to show it must be showing an ups ups um an upside trajectory rather than a stagnant trajectory so that's why quarter and quarter then becomes very important if a very big company okay very steady financially i would normally compare year on year okay mm -hmm. okay so uh, do you have any example of the property turnaround stock there's another question <laughs> i don't have any example right <laughs> now i think uh, uh -huh. that's the property market in malaysia has been has uh is currently is still well supported like we have not seen the kind of decline like uh we did in 2008 and uh, and until such time happens, then there'll be a lot of opportunities. Yeah. Mm, okay. So um, for technology stocks, uh, how do we make comparison consider, considering that there are so many tech stocks? Uh? That is why when it comes to technology, I, I don't really invest in a lot of uh, um, you know, technology is something that I try to avoid. Okay, um, why? Because it's a very fast-changing kind of uh, of uh, environment, and the only type of technology stock that is worthwhile investing are the giants. Okay, because they have the kind of money and they have the kind of um, uh, um, ability. Okay, to to change things, to change trends, to change the technology. You know, but if let's say you are a small cap company, for you to 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 change, to to change uh, um, technology, okay, needs a lot of capital, and unfortunately, a lot of uh, small companies they don't have that unless there's a big investor. They have a very brilliant idea, and a big investor comes in and hey, you know, I, I'm I'm going to pump in few hundred million, okay. But such things are very rare in this country, okay, and um, and that is why. Um, Malaysia technology stocks are something that I'm um, I, when compared to uh, to the worldwide giants is something that I'm quite uh, 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 I, I would see the my again my own opinion uh, that the risks are stacked against our companies rather than you know having something to go for them yeah mm, okay yeah so there has been a conflicting definition of debt to equity and gearing ratio. So the question is on what is the definition? Is it debt to equity ratio is equal to long term debt divided by debt total equity, while gearing ratio is equal to total liabilities divided by total equity? Okay. There, there, there are some, there are some that, uh, that um, uh, uh, define it differently. Okay, some people say it's long-term debt uh, divided by total equity. But for me, I, I often use total liabilities because um, when it comes to liabilities, I do not want to have certain things that exclude this part of the liability and so on because the total liabilities show the extent of the damage. So it is a worst case scenario that, I, that, you know, that, that shows the total amount of liabilities. But if you start to... Um, exclude certain items, then that that doesn't show the real picture. So that's why you have to be uh, very careful. I prefer to to take the approach of total liabilities. Yeah. Now the other thing is um, again, uh, previously people have asked before. There's also a lot of measurement that is based on EBITDA. Is EBITDA is something that I totally avoid because um, it is earnings before interest. Um, uh, uh, depreciation, uh, taxation, and amortization. Yeah. So when you borrow money, that's interest. You cannot say that I decided to use EBITDA, okay, because um, uh, it, it gives a better picture. No, when you exclude interest, it's something that you really take out as a burden, okay. What we need to do is to analyze things based on everything thrown in to know what is the extent of the damage. Only when you know the extent of the damage can you can you be able to see whatever management, whatever things that management does, and a positive is moving away from the extreme case. Okay, but when, that's why EBITDA is not 
accepted as a in the in the gap uh, in the gap accounting uh, the general accepted accounting practices okay it is something that commonly used to tell sell to the investors because they have a lot of debt and their interest is very high okay so they say that our uh, EBITDA is how many is is how good how good okay but because they are so burdened by that so that carries an interest so that's why they prefer to use EBITDA so nowadays a lot of companies they use EBITDA simply because they want to shout about it and not to tell the world that actually their earnings are very bad okay so uh, uh, these are these are the things you should uh, okay. be watchful for yeah so um so the next question is also on uh, what are the sunset industries that you would avoid at the moment i think the kind of sunset industry has to do with um uh printing okay because we are moving fast into the digital age okay now very interestingly yeah uh, uh there's there's an article i read uh I'll, I'll just glance through that a lot um, that banking may be a sunset industry uh, not now okay but further down the road simply because of the blockchain technology because of the blockchain technology everything is ledgered okay we don't require a bank because of uh, is is you know uh, banks would one day becomes uh, uh, obsolete okay this is a very interesting thing but I'm not saying that it will happen but uh, some technologies and economies are predicting that uh, it's just like uh, because of the evolution of uh, electrical vehicles uh, maybe a few decades down okay the oil and gas industry may be a sunset industry okay um, so because of whatever whatever industry that changes okay has a lot to do with improvement in technology and in processes yeah uh, or even oil and gas okay cool yeah so um, do um, you because by yeah because by 20 by by 20 uh, 30 a lot of european countries would be strictly electric vehicles okay mm -hmm. and us they have not set any deadline china is setting a deadline especially china just recently mentioned that they are going to set a deadline to ban fossil fuel vehicles in china now china yeah, has read about that. 200 million 200 million vehicles can you imagine that how how the oil oil and gas industry will be depressed but thankfully oil and gas still have use uh, because uh, they are used in a lot of manufacturing for example uh, plastic fiberglass you know uh, uh, paint and all those yeah so it won't definitely die but actually oil would then much uh, uh, the demand would you know move up in the next few years then it will come down uh, towards uh, the 2030 mm, okay so the next question is on do we get informed earlier before the dilution of share is it the same like rights issue or do we get to buy the cheaper diluted share okay sometimes the company may issue rights issue okay and sometimes it could be a price private placement so which means if let's say there's a huge investor that comes in okay uh they the company would just issue a share and inform the shareholders that they will have this private placement of how many shares to this investor okay and uh it may not come with the rights issue so actually it depends definitely the company will announce it so when if let's say it's a private placement and if let's say the share amount is huge then definitely be, the dilution would be very great and the share price would be uh, further depressed mm -hmm. okay so the last question is on what is the percentage of insider consider safe to invest in turnaround stock uh? well i guess it's that inside the news uh, or inside the buying um, I, I i i think insider buying would be the best indicator yeah right. um because management they would know that the company is doing doing well and if let's say there's any significant announcement you know sometimes busa would, would come up with announcement of significant shareholder or something like that okay so if let's say the uh, you know persons um in the board of director you know they are starting to accumulate that means that you know they have confidence in that company and that should reinforce uh your confidence in that you know no one in the board of director is bailing out they are not disposing share rather they are accumulating so this is a good sign 
Mm, okay. With that, we have come to the end of our webinar today. So yeah, thank you so much for all your time. And uh, uh, with that, uh, I want to come to the next slide, which is next webinar. Some of you asking about sunset stocks and to uh, to answer your questions. Next month, we'll talk about how to identify sunset stocks. Now, sunset stocks are those stocks that are in a, which are not in a really good industry. For example, like, um, like maybe newspaper printing, like what PC said earlier, the printing industry. And then maybe next month, we'll dissect what are the sunset industries. And then uh, it will be on November 7, 2017, Tuesday, 8.30 to 10 o'clock. And that is a registration link. And uh, I will copy the link and send it over to you uh, maybe right now. Hang on a minute. Huh? Okay, just give me a second. All right. So with that, um, I want to thank everybody for being on this webinar. And thank you so much for coming and if you have any questions you can still write to pc at wpg at gmail.com all right so if, and then i will see you all next month for our webinar all right I'm sending over the link to you shortly all right with that thank you and have a pleasant evening yeah thank you and thanks for tuning in good night yeah good night hang on yeah just wait for my link I just can't can't send it over for now Okay, just give me a minute. All right, so I'm sending over the next webinar link with that. Thank you so much and have a pleasant evening. Bye-bye. Sending over over the chat box.